Hello and a very warm welcome to the MA students of our university. As you are all aware, uh, our MA program comprises a number of courses out of which we have a course entitled New Literatures in English. Basically what we have included in this course are literatures from various countries like Africa, Canada, the Caribbean and Australia and so on and so forth. Basically our discussion today revolves around the Australian component since it is our privilege to have here with us Professor Paul Sharid from the University of Wollongong, Australia. We have already recorded a video with him uh, and basically our discussion uh, centered around the definition of new literatures in English, the similarities and differences of uh, these literatures and uh, the basic reasons for the emergence of these literatures. Uh, this is our second session, the second video and what we are going to talk about in this video uh, the, uh, is about the uh, uh, major novelists of Australia with primary focus on Patrick White and the text which is prescribed for the students which is the solid mandala. So uh, over to Professor Paul. Uh, Professor Sharad, uh, what are the, who are the major Australian novelists who are writing in English these days? I guess we would have to name two first. One is Peter Carey and uh, the other will be David Maloof. Um, then probably Elizabeth Jolly at the moment. Um, equally Thea Astley has been writing for an awful long time now and is still, still going strong. Um, some of these are less well known but uh, highly respected figures nonetheless. Carey obviously has got the Booker Prize and is a well known figure, uh, commutes internationally and so forth and uh, has just written a very interesting book in fact uh, which is a rewrite of Great Expectations in some, some form where he takes the figure of the convict figure of Magwitch and returns him to London and bases the story around him but also investigates the nature of writing through a, a fictionalised version of Charles Dickens in the story. It's, it's quite a nice play and a reconstruction of the style of a 19th century novel. Um, Maloof is, is a wonderful stylist. Uh, he was originally a poet and it shows in the, his, his rhythms particularly in, in fiction. Um, I still think his best book is Imaginary Life um, which doesn't actually talk about Australia um, except that it does indirectly. It's, it's about Ovid and his exile in, in the Roman Emperor, Empire. Um, he's also written about Europe um, and has returned to writing what are fairly familiar uh, books now about exploring Aust white Australian um, colonial past but has also got some very good essays uh, about again the settling into the culture of a place. Uh, he's particularly interested in, in houses and, and space um, and the translation of styles from Europe to, to an in this case Australian setting but uh, different settings across the world. What happens when things shift? Um, so uh, Elizabeth Jolly I mentioned, she's uh, now quite old but highly regarded as a, a, a sort of leading uh, figure from women's writing and as doing interesting things with um, if you like postmodern um, play on, on narratives in, in text and the play between text and reality uh, particularly with, with uh, attention to the social constructions of gender and how these are you know constructed for us in, in various narrative forms um, and people can move in and out of them and she plays with that quite interestingly and like many writers including um, Patrick White uh, move towards a, a blurring of genre boundaries so that the novel crosses with autobiography, crosses with biography um, in quite fascinating ways at times. I mean, th there are many, many more, um, but they can but as far as do the with major is, figures, yes. Uh, no, as far as the novel is concerned, it's Patrick White that sort of the name of Patrick White comes to the forefront immediately. So what would you say that, uh, what, what is it that makes Patrick White great as a novelist? Various things, I guess. Firstly, productivity. Um, he was still writing at the end of his life. Um, he, he produced plays, stories and novels. Um, produced an autobiographical autobiogra fictional work which is hard to pin down but very interesting um, and, and just wrote an enormous amount um, is the first thing I guess you'd have to say. 
Secondly, I suppose, uh, his style. He's a very fine stylist, plays with syntax, plays with rhythms, plays with, with speech. And, and with that sense of looking at, um, at words themselves um, and, and the oddity of communication, it becomes almost a, a theme dominating his, his work at times. A lot of his figures are artists, not just writers, but painters and, and so forth. And, and the, the wrestling with the problem of communication between people, particularly in the Australian context where you know, a lot of Australians, particularly males and particularly through the, the 40s, 50s, had this ethos of, of taciturnity. You never showed your feelings, you didn't talk much. Um, so how, to, how does a writer deal with characters like this and, and how do characters like this communicate or fail to communicate and wrestle with the problem of failing to communicate um, whatever vision of life they have? Um, the other aspect, I, I guess, is, is that he was one of the first serious philosophical novelists to, to me meld together a European philosophical consciousness, if you like, with a very strong sense of the pioneering ordinary Australian and his or her landscape, both social and, and natural. Um, I mean, the very vivid pictures of like Voss, for example, of the outback, the desert, uh, the heat, the dust, um, and many of these were turned into highly graphic series of paintings by some of his, his contemporaries. Um, also investigations of history, um, the story of Eliza Fraser in um, A Fringe of Leaves. Um, looking at the characters, he's very good at character investigation and analysis. Um, probing of, mo of motives, probing of how motives relate to social situations. Um, how in this case somebody from the lower classes of Britain married up, um, battled with social pretensions both at home and in colonial society, was shipwrecked, taken in by an Aboriginal population, had to adapt to that culture and then finally had to adapt back to white society. What, what accommodations are going on there? Um, it's a very fine analysis of, of um, states of mind, um, also social conventions and, and how people have to break them to survive, but also how they get confirmed and also in order to survive. Um, so in a sense, I suppose he's, he's a figure who people would have looked to as a wisdom writer, if you like, um, as somebody who was bringing modernist techniques into the Australian largely realist, social realist novel, uh, although others had been making attempts. Um, and, and somebody, obviously, who, who brought Australian literature to the consciousness of an acceptance of uh, a wider international community in a way that people hadn't managed uh, completely mm -hmm. successfully before. Has he written a lot of novels? Um, I was trying to to uh, top them up in my head um, at a rough count, one, two, three, four, probably ten uh, at a rough guess. That's um, quite a lot. Uh, to, to come back to the uh, novel that we have prescribed for our students, The Solid Mandala, what is your personal response to the, uh, the novel? Well, I was reading it the other day for the first time in a long, long time. Um, I guess two things struck me immediately. One, how very much of its time it was, um, and this is the 40s, 50s we're talking about, and the other is how very Australian it is. Um, a lot of Australians look down on white as particularly in his early years as an expatriate, as a sort of betrayer of his country, um, satirising things people didn't want to have satirised to the outside world. But what we have, I think, in, in characters like uh, Waldo and uh, oh. Arthur and uh, Mrs Dunn and so forth, are some very detailed, quite harsh, but also quite sympathetic, I think, um, analyses of ordinary Australian people. Um, and this was part of his project, particularly in, in The Tree of Man, the, the first big epic, where again he took very ordinary, pioneering, lower class, working class people um, with few expectations of life beyond immediate material betterment, a, a small house, a quarter acre block and a bit of garden to go with it. Um, and the attempt was to dignify these people, make them worthy of a place within a national literature, um, I suppose in, in a way that um, 
people like Thomas Hardy did with, with a small corner of England for, for working class people of the time, um, to bring their language into literature and to look at, at their psyches, at what made them tick, what was underneath the often inarticulate surface, um, what dreams they had, what fears they had, etc. So um, to, to come back to the idea of, of how very much of its time it was, we're talking of, of the period when, um, immediately post-war, that phase of, of the myth of Australian identity as, as the pioneering society, as the convict system and, and so forth, the working class dream, was being slowly changed, um, particularly under urbanisation and post-war industrialisation and migration. Um, if you remember, there's a mention of a Chinese woman in this novel. Um, she becomes one of many migrate, uh, migration figures of, of new kinds of people. The Jews are mentioned in this book in the central position and they c occur in other books as well. Uh, a lot of people were coming into Australia from the late 40s onwards. Um, so there was a questioning of which way would the society go? Um, what we have here in Sarsaparilla is a little country town in the back of nowhere uh, which has just been overtaken by the fringes of, of Sydney expansion, by the expansion of the middle class, um, the nouveau riche, uh, upwardly mobile, with ordinary people being, to an extent, swamped, um, being given a view of life that they hadn't aspired to before, that they wanted to aspire to, but it was also a kind of life they'd been taught to scorn. So they're caught in a, a double bind, in a sense. Um, so you can see the, the two ladies on the bus. They know the right things to do. They know the conventions. They're not willing to be too uh, friendly to each other. Um, but at the same time, uh, they look down in, in, or criticise in various ways um, people with artistic pretensions, people with money, um, the lady with the chauffeur, even Mrs uh, Minto is, is, is quite good-hearted, but nonetheless, um, manipulates people, throws garden parties in order to you know, <coughs> bring people together and so forth. So it, it's a, a setting of very careful people who've been brought up to follow the rules, to wear hats, to observe all the social conventions, um, thrown into chaos by the war uh, and questions about what is civilization? Is it more than just following the rules? Um, is there anything underneath the rules bar chaos? Um, and uh, and people who, uh, who belonged to a world that was being satirised, not just by white, but by many other people. Barry Humphreys was a comedian who dressed up as a woman called Edna Everidge, and there was this, this strong concern with mediocrity um, in that new democratic levelling society where there was supposed to be nobody better than anybody else. Um, it was all a positive thing in terms of equity, it was also a negative thing in terms of pulling down all those who aspired to break free of, of the common mould. Um, so with people like Waldo, with people like um, Arthur even, who are slightly out of the ordinary, um, it's, the, it's the tyranny of the conventional which keeps pulling them back. Um, and, and this was very much of its time. Uh, you can see he, he's also talking about Australian literature as, as Medi mediocre. Um, the, one of the librarians has a friend who was a priest who wrote a series of, of comic sketches around the Boree Log. And White is obviously setting this up as the sort of hallmark of Australian literature at the time. And it's a very light comic work. Um, and, and obviously he's putting himself forward as the new way to go, the more complex, the more sophisticated, the more intellectual uh, art form. Um, being fully aware that people are highly suspicious of ideas, um, they're threatening. Uh, they show perhaps that there is something lacking in what previously has been a comfortable existence. So Mrs. Dunn doesn't want to open her door to anything that's going to upset the apple cart. Um, and it's also a society in which, um, again, from particularly in New South Wales anyway, from, from the heritage of, of the convict system, the church was seen as part of officialdom as part of oppression, as part of um, an unnecessary icing on the social cake. One went to church, one 
did the ritual, but it didn't mean much. And people are constantly in white brought up against the edges of that ritual protection, that there is something there, or if there's not, then life is meaningless. Um, to that extent, what we've got here is a very existentialist novel. Um, that opening scene, and this is a novel which comes out at the same time as his plays were pu being published, um, what we have is a dramatic sketch in that bus scene, where the language is, is very sort of waiting for Godot-ish. Um, it's very uh, Harold Pinterish. Uh, the silences in between are as meaningful as what, what is said. Um, the spaces between people are as meaningful as the contacts they make with each other. And along with a sort of 18th century satire, um, lots of jokes in this book about particularly names. Um, Mrs. Dunn particularly, I keep coming back to her, White's famous pronouncement in the 40s about Australian literature was the dreary, dun-coloured offspring of, of journalism or something. Um, he's playing on brownness through the book, um, drab, ordinary, boring, um, but safe. And what happens when people have their safety barriers stripped away from them? Um, they're either faced with the void or they find something um, to, to pull things together. I'm, I'm reminded of um, the Robert Frost poem, um, for once then something, somebody looks in a well, gets a glimmer of a hint at inspiration, a hint at meaning, a hint at spiritual values. Um, it's never fully spelt out, it's never rigidified into any set system. Uh, and that's its charm and that's its prophetic visionary quality uh, that Arthur has naturally. Waldo sees but, but can't get and is embittered by not being able to get it. And, and other people just don't get it at all um, and, and are fearful of it. So uh, to that extent, I mean, we can set it up against you know, philosophers like Heidegger, where we're cast into life. Death is, is the sort of limit to life which gives life meaning. Um, and in that space, we, we struggle in anguish and angst and, and so forth. People are refined through suffering um, or create their own meaning out of acts of will and, and everyday life. It is the story of the polarity of human behavior, basically as embodied in these uh, two twins. As embodied in the twins, twins. yes. I mean, the, the one twinning goes... One is an extrovert, goes, one is an introvert. One yes, a contrast, but also, yes. um, as you say, I mean, they can't live without each other. Um, and so we finish up with a sort of yin-yang yes. symbol. Yes. Um, the Upanishads are mentioned in, in the book at some right. stage, so he's, he's looking for not just the formal Christian tradition of white Australia, but other possibilities of uh, spirituality, um, Chinese, Indian, Eastern as well as Western. So, um, and, and Alice through the looking glass, again, duality, mirror images, yeah. um, different realities that, that are coexistent nonetheless. So, um, all this is going on. Um, and, and the other thing, I guess, that comes out immediately from the, from the opening scene is, is, again, the Australianness of the dialogue. Um, those very short phrases, often incomplete, and Mrs. Um, Poulter, I think it is, says, oh yes, well, you, you know, it's so, and so, so far as the crow. Mm -hmm. As the crow, says the other one. <laughs> oh, as the crow flies, um, which of course is idiomatic, um, sh shortest line between two points. Um, and there are often the, these truncated conversations, these silences. So sentences come down to one word, full stop, another word, full stop. <laughs> and and it's, it's both an indication of the taut, cut back taciturn way of people speak to each other, uh, full of um, full of slang of the time, um, spondulics, lots of money, you know, huge piles of cash, um, a chivou, a tamasha, um, a dunny, an outside wooden hole in the ground toilet. Um, so I mean this is this is part of what he was doing and part of what shocked people as, at the time. Um, people saw this as irreverent, in, un undignified, not proper stuff for literature, capital L. Uh, and of course what he was saying was, well, yes it is. Um, it's just as worthy as um, Faulkner writing about Southern, New uh, Southern America or uh, Dickens writing about Cockneys in London and so forth. Um, but in, in, in playing with that language also, he's, he talks about you know, wrestling with the sticks and stones of words. Um, playing the material against the the abstract, um, God is rock crystal, says Arthur at one point, and God is manifest in various physical uh, forms, objects, even gobs of spittle and, and dots of paint in his other, other novels. Um, 
and here it's that glass marble with the whirl of the colour in, in the centre of it. So he, he's taking ordinary things and turning them into symbols. Um, in doing that, he's also uh, bringing into the Australian fictional scene um, a set of modernist practices. Um, Joycean techniques, for example. If, if you take that very long section on Waldo, 200 pages I think it is, what it is is a day's, an afternoon's stroll as the two brothers go for a walk, but into that is packed through flashbacks, through internal mental states, um, a whole life. Um, so it's this play with time, it's a play with multiple perspectives. Um, the women, if you remember, look out of the bus window and see these brothers. Um, we flash to the brothers and get their side of the of the picture. Yeah. Eventually we come back and we, the brothers notice the women in the bus. So we, we're constantly changing perspective, as like a Cubist painting. Um, life is not mono-linear directional uh, anymore. It's, it's Multi pluralistic, multifaceted. Yes. Um, and, and with that, the interest in um, the Wolfian interest in what's going on in our heads. Reality is not just clock reality, but time of, of mental life, um, stream of consciousness technique. All this is going on, and, and at the time it was very new uh, to readers. Uh, many readers got quite upset by it. Um, and the, the other things they got upset uh, about, his, his affront to, to the nation was, was not just spilling the negative side of life to an outside public. Um, I mean, people have said the same thing about uh, Arundhati Roy and other writers in the same context, um, Salman Rushdie. Um, his first affront was to, to claim to be a serious writer on an international f setting. Um, other people had been less ambitious, if you like. Um, and there, there was that mistrust of people who firstly went overseas, and when they became successful, um, mistrust of what terms they were being accepted on and were they betraying their country and culture and so forth. That was uh, really very interesting, uh, Professor Sharon. I mean, a whole new insights have been given into this book and I'm sure if you go back to reading it once again, we'll get a whole new perspective into uh, what Patrick mm -hmm. White actually meant when he was writing this. And I think now we are running out of time. Sure. So I'd just like to extend a vote of thanks on our behalf, on the behalf of the students, for a very, very in interesting session. Thank you Pleasure. so much. Thank you.